Welcome back to the Plus Ultra Fitness Podcast, ladies and gentlemen. I am your host, Max Hall, and this is the last character analysis episode of season three. Get excited. We are talking about Toga, the bloodthirsty villain from My Hero Academia today. And oh boy, is it a lot of fun talking about Toga. There's so many interesting, fine, little nuanced details about this character. Um, Fair warning, guys, there will be spoilers. Um, No manga spoilers, but there will be spoilers from the anime up to the latest season that just came out, season five of My Hero Academia. If you don't want to be spoiled on some things that happen with the character of Toga in season five, then do not proceed until you've gone back and you've watched that. This podcast is brought to you by First Step Apparel, the dopest anime fitness workout t-shirts on the market. Use the code PLUSULTRA12 to save yourself a little bit of money off of some t-shirts. And to support the podcast, go to the First Step Apparel website linked below and use the code PLUSULTRA12. Without further ado, let's get started. Toga is a member of the League of Villains. She joined around the same time that Twice and Dobby and Spinner did, um, right after the Camino incident where everybody faced um, our good friend Stain. And she was she saw Stain on the TV and she saw his ideals and became a Stain worshiper and a Stain follower. And that drove her into the League of Villains. And she's become a kind of staple point of the League of Villains. And one of our main antagonists of the series that complement what is the League of Villains. Do you want to talk a little bit about her personality, Tiffany? Yeah, I think it's important to describe too what she looks like to get an idea of her personality. Because she's also like a high school age student. She's like, I think, 17 in the current season. And she's like, teet and has almost like a doll-like face with like blonde little pigtail buns. So she looks very cute, um, but is also very, very violent. And so she's sadistic in a way. Uh, She likes um, inflicting pain on others, but in the most excited and cheerful and happy way possible. Um, In her view, it's kind of like an act of love or the biggest like act of adoration she could give someone is to want to cut them and taste their blood. So um, she's a little mentally unstable, as one might be if they found themselves in the position to wanting to cut people and drink their blood. Um, But it's one of those things where she also sort of has like a twisted idea of what constitutes love and friendship and tells herself a lot and says often like it's only natural to want to be like the ones that you love so she has kind of a chameleon um sense to her personality as well as she tries to um conform and please to whatever group she's around or um make herself seem appealing to people that she wants to feel affectionate towards her so that's kind of her personality And she can also have some empathy and kindness as well. We get to see that interest first. It's just kind of overshadowed overshadowed sometimes by her um, sadistic side. Yes. And I think uh, the character of Toga in general does a really good job of like outlining the impacts that quirks can have on certain people within the society's personalities because they get certain gifts and that affect their personalities because that gift might not be seen as you know, something that is very widely accepted in that universe. And that really comes down to her quirk, which is transform. So when she drinks the blood of someone, she is able to transform into them. Now, as season five approaches, she goes through a quirk transformation and she is actually able to use the powers of the people that she um, transforms into as well. So throughout the anime, we see her constantly trying to collect the blood 
of different characters in the anime so that she can transform into them because that allows her to kind of infiltrate different um, events. Like she infiltrates the um, hero exams, the pro the licensing exams. He She turns into one of the characters there and infiltrates it. And that's kind of her main role within the League of Villains is infiltration, but she tries to collect the blood of people that she really loves and admires and wants to be friends with because she sees that as kind of a way of getting closer to them. Now, obviously, we have characters like Deku and Uraraka and uh, any of the heroes that don't necessarily think that having their blood collected and drank is a good thing. Um, But we do see that some of the characters that maybe don't mind it as much in the League of Villains... um, she forms closer connections with and you know they're okay with it and she's okay with their powers it's kind of accepting in a a weird kind of way uh for the antagonist and i think you know we could go all down all kinds of rabbit holes about like how that affects the story and how you know the bad guys you know certain elements of them aren't that bad when you like look at it but obviously wanting to destroy society so you can just do whatever you want there is some some elements of that that just can't happen um which is why the heroes try to stop them so um because she tries to collect the blood of people she admires she sees deku and the first time that she sees deku she instantly falls in love with him izuku midoriya is the love of her life and she wants to be as close to him as possible and be around him all the time and she admires him greatly so because of that she wants to collect his blood (laughs) and it's a it's a really interesting relationship because anybody close to Deku as well she also wants to collect their blood and be close to them as well because she sees them as a connection she feels connected to them through their connection to Deku now um the the main one that kind of comes to mind is Uraraka. Do you want to talk a little bit about her relationship to Uraraka? Yeah, I think her relationship starts in in the similar way you're talking about of where it's like Uraraka has a connection to Deku, therefore Toga wants to be part of that um, connection piece. And for her and in her mindset, if the closer and closer approximations you can get into transforming into someone until she's just finally like really loved and adored. And so she's like, Uraraka, perfect. And, but she, she does it in just such the strangest way. And like, I'll talk about my favorite scene later, but whenever like she wants to collect her blood, but she also wants to be her friend. And like, she will say like really um, like positive things of like, you're so lovely while also trying to stab her and get her blood out of her. And I think it's interesting too, because while I think it's definitely primarily because of her interest in Deku, I think she has some sense of like mutual respect mixed in there with Uraka and her capabilities and just how she is as a person. And I think we see that in like the um, villain story arc where, you know, Uraka is one of the people she transforms into in like her time of most intense need. And um, it's Uraka's power that she ends up up leveling into being able to use um, as well. So I think there is more meaningful connection than just the fact that Uraka is attracted to Deku and that there's, uh, I think maybe, um, Toga sees a little bit of herself in Uraka as well. Yes, definitely. Um, I think it's really interesting too, that, you know, we see throughout that villain arc as she goes along, she really just wants to live in this society where she can do, whatever she wants which really ties into her relationship with Shigaraki is Shigaraki is like a beacon of hope for her of you know he wants he wants to create the society where people can do whatever they want mm-hmm. and everybody's accepted and by I mean accepted because anybody who's unaccepting just dies which isn't the right way of going about things but in her mind she's lived this life where she's always had a different view of normal than everybody else has. And we see that in season five when she's being interviewed is, you know, the, the ladies like, like what happened to you that made this feel wrong? What happened to you that made, made you, that made, you know, made you like this. And she's like, nothing happened to me. I don't feel ashamed of the way I am. This is just 
how I've always been. This is always what I've thought of as is normal. And when I didn't do this, when I didn't just try to cut people and drink their blood, I was just putting on a mask to try to fit in and try to be like somebody else. So once I started accepting myself and being who I really am, that's basically when I kind of came to this awakening. And I think that plays really well into her relationship with Stain as well as that's kind of the ideal that she got attached to with Stain was he wanted to follow Stain's ideals of making society a better place. And she thought that that was really, really cool because she wanted to live in a better place where she would be more accepted and people would love her for who she was. And she didn't have to wear a mask. She wanted to live in a society where she could just be herself. So yeah, I think it's kind of an interesting tie in to how she relates to Stain and Shigaraki in that, you know, she finds them this really like symbol, kind of like we see like Deku um, look at All Might as like the symbol of peace. We get to see her look at Stain and um, Shigaraki as the symbol of hope for her way of going about things in society becoming normal her getting to do whatever she wants with the people that she loves. Um, So I I don't want to know what that would look like. I feel like that would look like Deku and Uraraka being trapped in a cage and just being cut all day while she fantasizes over them. But, um, (laughs) (laughs) but that's, that's what she, that's what she hopes for. That's what she wants. And I think that that's pretty admirable in kind of a weird fucked up way. Um, So also following the, um, the ideals of Stain, we get to see twice kind of join at the same time and twice and um, Toga become quite close. Do you want to talk about the relationship between Ty- Twice and Toga, please? And thank you. Yes, I think for sure, like they're the oddest couple, but also just, I mean, they're not like a romantic couple, but just a, a pair um, of friends. And yet they make the most sense of being best friends in a way as well. Um, because I think they both have, you know, they can bond over not being accepted and taken very seriously and respected by, um, society at large twice also has his own struggles with mental stability, um, and needs a lot of like, he gets very worked up and needs a lot of comforting. And I think those are some of those softer sides of Toga we get to see because for whatever reason, she just really values um, values and cares about him in a more real way. And we see ha- uh, her offer him, you know, moments of kindness to give him the supports that he needs to handle the things he struggles with. And likewise, he feels very uh, supportive and protective of her for that because she's one of the first people to really treat him that way without also like diminishing him like she there's that mutual respect that they're both standing on and so I think it's a really beautiful thing whenever she is what inspires him like in the situation um, surrounding her when she's being interviewed and she's close to death um, to level up in his power and ability to protect her um and that kind of like act of friendship and love. And so I really enjoy their relationship and Twice is one of my other favorite villains anyways. Um, as we were talking about before, he's kind of like my hero's Deadpool. So who doesn't love that? But um, yeah, I think they have like a really endearing, albeit weird friendship that I really enjoy watching unfold. That's Awesome. Um, yeah, what do you like about the character of Toga? I really like how even though she is a very unsettling um, person to be around, um, which is something that maybe I also don't like, but it's villains we're talking about. So there's always those things that are just going to be uncomfortable. And that kind of is one of the things that makes them good. But I like how unsettling she is and completely unapologetic about her existence because it seems like she has lived so much of her life trying to hide behind masks and put on a mask on her face that makes her feel more acceptable to the people around her because like they were saying that all the students around her and everyone always said oh she was such a cheerful and sweet girl and then that was all a mask of her having to suppress who she was so I also really like that at some point that mask broke and she just really fully embraced 
um, who she is. And she did kind of get screwed over on the quirk, uh, you know, situation. I mean, like, how normal was she really going to have a chance at being when her quirk, like, requires her to drink blood of other people to transform, you know? Um, that's just going to kind of mess you up a little bit and not give you a good place in society. So I really, yeah. And I like that they made her like, kind of like cute and fluffy. She almost looks like an Alice in Wonderland or something kind of character. So that's what I like. What do you like? (laughs) So a lot of the same things, but first and foremost, I like her character design. You're right. She's a very cute character, which is cool. She's also super badass. I think, you know, despite the fact that she doesn't have any physical enhancement quirks, she is very, fast and very agile we get to see her use some pretty crazy agility moves when she is infiltrating the um, heroic uh, exams the licensing exams we get to see her show off some really badass kind of agility trying to tap everybody in season five when she uses Uraraka's quirk and taps everybody that she's fighting and makes them float and then splats them on the ground um pretty so she's a pretty badass character too like i have to to admit when it comes to antagonists like obviously she is not the main antagonist she is not our shigaraki our one for all but she makes a very good complementary protagonist to the antagonist group that we're given with really really good you know character design character powers and abilities as well as character depth i do really like the depth of her of like taking off that mask and like being who she wants to be um, and just like living life kind of unapologetically. Now, with that said, I think that kind of plays well into what my dislikes for the character are, is that obviously she has to be this way to be a villain, but I do think that it's like one of those things where it's like, yes, she unapologetically apologetically lives how she wants to live but she does not do it within the boundaries of others she is so far outside of like living life the way that she wants to live it that she has no respect for the boundaries of others like other people probably don't want their blood taken and that is a totally normal thing and okay no matter in what society you're in so like all i can say is like consent like you know i I mean, I'm sure there's like blood fetishes and stuff like that, where people are okay with that in like real life. Like I'm sure in the, my hero universe, like (laughs) similar things exist where like people would be okay with that with consent. But the fact that she's like, nope, fuck your consent. I'm taking your blood because I like you. That's, that's where I get kind of like off put by the character. And that's where my dislike comes from. What do you dislike about the character? I mean, I guess the same thing. I feel like as far as, like, if this was a hero, obviously there would be bigger issues. But when it's supposed to be a villain character, I really think she's fantastic. So I don't have any dislikes in that uh, perspective of her. I think she makes a great villain. I do dislike her lack of consent and boundaries for other humans. That's what would make her not, you know, I wouldn't want to invite her over for dinner or whatever, because you can't trust that she's not just going to get that look and be like, you're tasty and decide she, she wants some. (laughs) And that would be concerning. So and it, I think with villains, if it's a good villain, you always have that thought of like, what if, like the, the what if she like was supported in her quirk. And so she could like be a hero in a way. And she just had people donate their blood to her in a more like safe, kind and consensual way. Like what if, but she's a villain. So she didn't live out her what if she, she lived out her, this is what you get um, version. So yes. And I think it's a very important note to say, like, society kind of made her that way, right? Like, society didn't accept her. Society did not put her in a position to be like, you could use this power to be absolutely amazing at, uh, at like, being an infiltration hero if a lot of different people mm-hmm. donated their, their blood to you. Or, or like stuff like that, or if like blood samples were collected from like crime scenes with villains and you were able to use that blood to, you know, infiltrate the different villains and stuff like that. Like we could use that if we could make it work, you could have been an awesome hero. 
But instead of society saying that, instead of society supporting her to be her best self with the gifts she was given, society said, those aren't the gifts we like. You hide those. Those are weird. They're not okay. You hide those. And that kind of brought her to a breaking point where she's like, well, fuck society. Then I'm going to do what I want. And I don't care what anybody else has to say. So I think that's a very good lesson of like supporting people um, instead of, you know, putting other people down which, yeah. So I guess, how do you personally relate to the character of Toga? Well, not in the um, collecting blood component of that character. Yeah. Um, not, not in that side. But I do feel like I can relate to that sense um, when we see her backstory and she's just kind of standing in a crowd. And when you see her, like the art is like just giving her kind of a blacked out face that kind of is chipping away. And we recognize that as her mask, you know, and she has this like kind of weird smile on her face. Um, and I think I can relate to that feeling of um, having times in my life, especially when I was younger, where I did not feel like I fit in and I didn't know how to fit in. I didn't understand the social rules and constructs and reading the subtext of knowing how to just fit in and flow with the other people. So I felt like that a lot, that I was wearing a mask that was just my best guess of what would make other people happy based on them telling me, you know, Oh, she's so kind. She's so friendly. She's so easy to get along with. But what they didn't see, like that was them seeing my mask. That wasn't seeing the damage underneath that, that that can do to a person's like self-esteem and self-worth. So I can relate to that feeling and also that uh, getting to that point where it's like, yeah, I'm not wearing that anymore. So, um, and having that feeling of transformation and freedom with that. Uh, what was lying below oh, my mask was not like a, a villain with bloodlust, but um, things that are a lot more um, reasonable. But uh, nonetheless, that's the uh, point of being able to relate that I had. What about you? I think basically the same thing. I think the mask was very, very good symbolism for like, you know, not understanding social cues and like dealing, you know, growing being autistic and whatnot, like you grow up and you don't understand a lot of social cues and you put on a lot of masks, just trying to like fit in with the people around you. Um, I didn't growing up. I also didn't really understand where I fit in with people. I was definitely a weird kid and nobody would ever just say, Hey, it's okay to just be that weird kid. It was more so no conform to this idea of what that should look like in society. And parts of that were, very, very hard. Parts of that were very, very difficult. I put on a lot of masks and tried to kind of blend in the best that I could. And I was never really happy. It caused me a lot of hurt. It caused me a lot of shame. And it, there was a lot of just crappiness that was involved in that. I, I never really felt like myself until I kind of started taking those masks off and just accepting myself for who I am and just living out life as I want it as you know as I wanted it to be and being myself so I think very much the same I, I think very similarly um it there wasn't like a level of bloodlust murderer underneath my mask <laughs> but I think that is a, a very good point to kind of go into is like no matter what's underneath that mask like no matter who somebody is I, and this will kind of go into my like life and or fitness lesson with uh, Toga is, you know, no matter who's under that mask, no matter what quirks somebody has, you know, there is, there's a place for them. There is a way for them to feel good about it. And if you support them and you encourage them to be themselves, they will figure out how to make that fit into society. Like, you know, somebody might get urges to hit somebody, for example. Well, obviously you do not disconsensually, you know, hit somebody, but maybe that same person might find solace in a sport where there's consensual hitting like boxing, or you're allowed to hit a bag, something like that. Right. But, you know, teaching people to control those emotions, to be themselves, but be it within the contents, uh, the like confines of like respecting everybody around them first comes with accepting who they are 
it doesn't come after. So that's, that's kind of my point with that there. What about you? What life and or fitness lesson would you take from Toga? We'll do favorite scenes after. Okay. Um, I think along the same lines as you, I don't think we can talk about Toga without just bringing up that point and that metaphor of wearing masks. And I think, you know, it's, it's sort of both sides of what we were just saying. One being the person who feels like they have to wear masks, that it's there. And I think there's also something to be said as we talk about this in like real life setting and not anime setting is that sometimes our masks are there because we put them there because we need them for our own sense of safety or um, stability. And so it's not something where you have to unmask all of your masks in in front of everyone in every context. But I think what we're more talking about is that sense of forced masking where it goes into that place of feeling like you have to be a people pleaser, that what makes you good is the perceptions others have about you. So you have to put that, um, your energy and intention there instead of allowing what's good about you just being yourself um, and letting that come out and finding places for acceptance. And so I think that lesson there is seeing what, on one side, what can happen if you do that to yourself for too long and how unhealthy that can be for you as an individual. Um, But then I think on the other side of that as well, kind of what you were saying as us as a collective or as a community of people, um, becoming safe spaces for people to just be who they are and how important that is too. Because whenever we were talking about like the, the what ifs of Toga, like there's no real reason that Kirk Kirk has to lead to the only option being a villain that is the way she is it doesn't have to but she was treated as any time that perk was expressed in any way like when they show her as just a little bitty child and she has a bird and she's saying oh it's so pretty it's so precious and she's been drinking its blood and her parents are like you look like a demon rather than like treating her like she's inherently bad instead of um, instead of like, she's inherently good. And if she had been treated like she was inherently good, that might've changed her, um, self image and consideration of, um, her own self-worth and resulted in a really different path. So I think that's the same thing for the way we treat people around us too. If we become a safe space and we assume that people are inherently good instead of inherently awful, we change the context in which we see them and in the ways they can see themselves, which results in just a healthier person and a healthier society overall. Agreed. What's your favorite scene with Toga? My favorite scene, (laughs) and I think, how do I say it? It was whenever she meets up and has like her first real encounter with Uraraka and Sue in the, um, in the woods and she's attacking them and trying to get their blood, but like is also trying to be their best friend. Like they're just having like a girl's hangout. And that was the moment when I was like, whoa, she is so fucked up. But also, like, I love her. Like, she just wants friends. And, like, so it was the point. That's, like, the point of empathy for me. And that's, like, my favorite thing and how villains sometimes or, like, the, like, Bakugo where he's not the the hero hero, but kind of an antihero in a way. Um, They always get me. Because if there's just that weird place of, like, that point of empathy where it's like, oh, they're not all bad. Suddenly I'm sold and I'm hooked. And that was that moment for, uh, for me with her of just like, wow, she is really, really weird and really kind of terrifying. And also just those friends. I'm like, oh man, maybe, maybe they should just give her some of them. <laughs> like maybe they should just like, what's the worst that could happen? Um, so that's my favorite scene just because it made her also seem like a real player in the villain game as well. And not just a uh, cute teenage girl sense what was yours um yeah so uh mine was when she gave twice her like handkerchief to like cover up his other half of face to me that was his face um that was just a very cute moment for me um i thought that that was really cool and i think that was like a nice sense of like empathy within the villains of like yeah they might be villains but they really deeply care for each other And I thought thought it was really awesome because, you know, you see her trying to stab people while wanting to be their best friends and drink their blood. But it was kind of one of those like moments where it was like she was just doing something nice for the sake of 
doing something nice and she was doing it to somebody that just accepted her for who she is and it kind of shows that little bit of a glimpse of like when she's just accepted for who she is she is a very nice a very sweet person that cares about the people around her I thought that that was super super cool I I quite enjoyed that so yeah that was my favorite moment Mm -hmm. where can people find you Tiffany you can find me on Instagram I'm at muse magic which is an at underscore Muse Magic and another underscore. And you can find Costa on the page or up in the stories. You can follow along with what I'm doing for fitness, which right now includes Max's UA beginner powerlifting program. So if you want to watch me suffer my way through hypertrophy, join me in my stories. Yes, yes. You're going to win that <laughs> hypertrophy. <laughs> um, yes. Is yeah. there a hypertrophy after? Do I get one? Yes. Is there a star? <laughs> <laughs> Is there a star? Yes. Uh, maybe. I don't know. I, I that would be a cool thing. I don't know how, <laughs> not, how not I would do okay. something like that. Just like uh I completed the UA first year program as like a sticker or something like that to send to people mm-hmm. for completing it. That'd be kind of neat. Mm-hmm. Um yes. <laughs> yes maybe something like that in the future um might put out a v2 or something that includes something like that but yeah guys if you guys want to jump on that program if you want to um try out some powerlifting, you guys can either go to my website or you guys can go to the first step apparel website and enter in your email to get your copy of my free ua first year beginning powerlifting ebook Thank you guys so much for listening to the last character analysis episode of season three. We will be back in several weeks um, after a little bit of a season break to do a little bit of something else. Um, We will be coming back and we will be doing a season four and we will have more characters. So if you guys want to let us know what characters you want to see in season four, message myself or Tiffany on Instagram Mm -hmm. and let us know what you want to see. And we can try to make sure that if it's an anime that we haven't seen yet, we can try to watch the episodes. Keep in mind, we do try to stay to some of the animes that are a little bit shorter um, just because like something like one piece, I'm sorry, guys, I, I love you but a thousand episodes to put out a character analysis episode uh we, happen. <laughs> yeah we're, we're we're just not there yet uh maybe maybe in future years but yeah you, you guys know what it is uh you guys can find me at max hall fitness on twitter instagram facebook or tiktok and if you guys want to support the podcast there's a paypal link below or you guys can use the code plus ultra 12 at first step apparel to pick yourself up some awesome apparel. It all helps support the podcast and yeah, like subscribe, rate the podcast. All of it helps us grow the podcast a ton. We love you guys. Thank you guys so much for listening and we really appreciate it. Peace out.